Hi, my name is Rachel Toovey. I'm a physiotherapist and PhD candidate with the Department of Physiotherapy at the University of Melbourne and the Murdoch Children's Research Institute in Melbourne, Australia. Today, I will discuss a study I completed as part of my Master of Public Health at James Cook University, which is in Queensland, Australia. But first, I'd like to thank my co-authors, Drs. Sue Reid and Adrian Harvey, and Associate Professors Barry Rowicki and Kerry ann Watt. Our paper in the 2017 April issue of DMCN is a case control study describing bicycle riding ability and the variables associated with ability to ride in ambulant children with cerebral palsy compared to the typically developing peers. Riding a two-wheel bike may be a goal for ambulant children with cerebral palsy. However, limited information exists on the ability of these children, or typically developing children for that matter, to ride a two-wheel bike. This case control study surveyed parents of 114 children with cerebral palsy and 87 parents of typically developing children aged 6 to 15. Parents were asked questions about their child and their family characteristics, including their family's interest in bike riding and how important it was to them that their child was able to ride a two-wheel bike. We also asked um, about their child's current and past ability to ride a bicycle and the age that they learnt to ride if they had at all. We, we used Kaplan-Meier methods to compare proportions able to ride at any given age between the two groups and logistic regression to separately assess the variables associated with ability to ride for children with cerebral palsy and typically developing children. As this graph shows, we found that while the proportion of children able to ride increased with age across both the cerebral palsy and typically developing groups, the proportion was lower at any given age for children with cerebral palsy. The estimated age that 50% of each sample would be able to ride a two-wheel bike independently was five years in the typically developing group and almost 11 years in the group of children with cerebral palsy. Following multivariate logistic regression, we found that higher motor function, so GMFCS level one compared to level two, was associated with being able to ride independently in the group of children with cerebral palsy. How important it was to the parents that their child was able to ride was actually associated with ability to ride independently in both groups. To our knowledge, this is the first published study to examine the proportion of independently ambulant children who are able to ride a two-wheel bicycle and their age at skill acquisition. Given the motor impairments and activity limitations associated with cerebral palsy, our results are not unexpected. By documenting the size of the gap between children functioning at these highest levels of motor function, so GMFCS levels 1 and 2, and typically developing children, we have highlighted the challenges that children face when learning complex but functional motor skills such as riding a two-wheel bike. However, the results of this study also highlight that independently ambulant children with cerebral palsy, in particular those classified GMFCS level 1, can learn to ride a bike independently if they're given the right conditions. It's also interesting that the influence of parental attitude on motor outcomes was highlighted across both groups. Knowledge of these variables will help guide goal setting and optimise the conditions for learning. Lastly, there's very little evidence to guide families and therapists on training bike riding skills in this population. The impact this has on the ability of children to ride is not known. These findings support further research into motor learning approaches for training bike riding skills in children with cerebral palsy. Thanks very much.